afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron and I'm doing a uh, presentation for a music presentation I'm giving at the end of the month. The presentation will be on uh, August the 20, 29th at 12 noon Pacific time. And I will be doing a presentation on um, music. And I have not done a presentation on music for a number of years. I've done one audio interview, uh, but this will be a full length um, presentation. And what I'm going to do today is a little promo for that presentation. Um, a, a couple of years back, I wrote a book called uh, Tuned in the Paranormal World of Music. And it was based upon a whole series of stories and episodes and events that look at the basically the paranormal world of music, uh, downloads, connections to UFO experiences, uh, musicians um, being experiencers. And I, I wrote the book to put this all in and that's what my lecture is gonna be about on the 29th. What I'm gonna to show today is a little uh, promo, but I'm gonna use some events, some new stories that would uh, that will be part of book two if I ever do a book two. There are tremendous numbers of stories. A lot of the stories were written up before me in a book called Alien Rock by Michael Luckman. And uh, Michael, when he heard I was doing a book on um, the UFO connection to music um, immediately said I've got enough for a second book and he started a second book and I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure he must have got pretty close to the second end of the second book and he had a stroke and died very suddenly so there's a manuscript floating around somewhere who where there are a pile of new stories uh, Michael Leckman was an, uh, a music producer in uh, New York City and was actually gonna set up a um, UFO Woodstock concert that was gonna take place at Pepperdine University. And some of the top rock bands in the world uh, who are experiencers, um, he was going to put them together and he was at the point where he was into getting permits and then um, had the stroke and died. So there's a big story behind um, um, rock music, UFOs, and there's also this paranormal connection that ties into all sorts of paranormal phenomena as it ties into music. Um, I have no musical background. Uh, my, um, this is my son when he was very, very young, playing on a giant theater organ that my father built. And my mother would play this and when she put the pedal right down, the entire house would shake. And um, so my mother is, was a church organist for uh, many decades. Uh, my father built theater organs and could play a little bit. My two sisters played in a, in a group that toured around uh, performing and just me and my son have no musical background. Uh, but that being said, I ended up writing a book on music and this is how it happened. This is my friend Chris Bledsoe, who's a prime experiencer, UFO experiencer in North Carolina. And um, I got to know him in 2012, and I visited him in 2013 uh, on a trip to Florida. I stopped by his house, and he was very gracious and showed me around, showed me where all the events had taken place. And he had uh, experienced what would be called an abduction experience uh, January the 8th, 2007, here on the uh, riverbank of the Cape Fear River outside of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And it's a long story, I won't go through the story, uh, but he had this experience and it involved a lot of UFOs and a lot of different types of beings walking around. Uh, there was five witnesses and it became a sort of a major story. And he now has a number of uh, government agencies watching him because he still has a very high level of contact with whatever the, whatever the intelligence is behind the phenomena. He, this is what I went to see him about. Um, I was, wanted to see this famous story about the burning tree. I won't get into it. Uh, this is a tree that um, is sort of very famous and um, he is able to heal people. Uh, a lot of people have been healed around this tree. A lot of very bizarre stuff happens around this tree. 
uh, what had happened is Warner Brothers had asked for a sign that they should do a movie on his case and uh, the tree started to burn and uh, it burned three times in six hours uh, the very next day. He gets a lot of stuff. This is what I call uh, Zendra Mist. Uh, it's a long story. It has to do with orbs and that sort of thing. Yeah, he's one of many people who has been able to film this um, the Zendra Mist. So he has a, a very high level of very weird paranormal phenomena occurring around uh, him and his family. Uh, this is the experience I had. I won't get into it. It happened in 2013 uh, when I was at his house. It involved his dog uh, where um, his dog started to bleed uh, very mysteriously, blood shooting all over the place. And um, I firmly believe it had to do with me because basically um, all the blood ended up on me. And um, I think it was sort of a demonstration of what I called the theory of wow. Um, they had been letting the dogs out of the house uh, on my way down to Florida. And um, I didn't think it was very spectacular. And so when I came back to visit Chris on the way back to Washington, DC to take the rental car back, um, this is what happened. The dog went by me, started to bleed, shot blood all over me uh, in very dramatic fashion. And I became a, a believer, whatever Chris Bletzel said, I knew that this guy was having some very weird types of experiences. The, the beings that he, um, in under aggression, talked about was was this being, the tall, about seven foot tall um, being that he called the Guardians. And he drew them and he drew the small ones. And so one day he gave me a phone call and he said he had a message for me from the Guardians. And uh, I was kind of thrilled. I said, okay, well, you know, what, what do they want? And he said, well, they want you to know the messages in the music. And at that point I said to him, well, you know, Chris, um, you may be talking to the wrong guy because I don't listen to music. I don't uh, play music. I have uh, no interest in music. And um, so perhaps the message is for, them, is for someone else. He then said to me, he said, well, the song you should listen to is Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. And I said, whatever, I really wasn't listening to him at that point. And then he said to me, he said, and the other song that you should maybe listen to is a song, a song called After the Girl Rush by Neil Young. And this is how I got dragged into the story. I never would have touched the story had it not been for the fact that Neil Young was involved in whatever this message was, that the message was in the music. And uh, the reason for that is that Neil Young, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, which is um, not the most famous place in the world, uh, but we do have a number of major uh, musicians who have come out of Winnipeg. And one of them was Neil Young. He was born in Toronto, but he grew up in Winnipeg and then moved to California um, when, his, when he became famous uh, with his band. And um, so I said to him, Neil Young is involved in this thing? And he said, yeah, Neil Young is involved. I said, really? I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. So I was intending then that I would, I would look into this whole thing. Now, the song that he said that I should look into was called After the Gold Rush by Neil Young. And when I saw the lyrics to the song, I knew um, exactly what he was talking about. The message is in the music. And uh, that's what really caught me was when I looked at the lyrics of the song. And what the lyrics are, are basically an experiencer message. A lot of experiencers are shown the screen on board the ship, 39% of people. Uh, a lot of them get this environmental message that we are destroying the world. And that's basically what is shown in uh, Neil Young's song. He talks about being in a bombed out basement. He said, well, I dreamed I saw the silver spaceships flying in the yellow haze of the sun. There were children crying and colors flying all around the chosen ones. And if you've read any sort of abduction material, you'll know that Yvonne Smith wrote two books uh, talking about the chosen, the chosen ones, which is what the experiencers are. And so Neil Young goes on all in a all in a dream, all in a dream, the loading had begun. Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home in the sun. Flying Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home in the sun. And so the idea was that um, the, the chosen would be picked up by flying saucers and moved to another planet. And a lot of um, experiences will talk about this cataclysm thing that they see end of the world these type of visions that uh, they will be moved and uh, people will be separated. So uh, I, now I'm hooked on the whole story. 
uh, the, the coincidence of Neil Young being involved and having this uh, message. And I started to, to pursue this story about the messages and the music. And what I first did is I'd had a download experience a year before this, and I started looking at downloads and realized that musicians were getting downloads. And the first one that I got was the very famous one yesterday by Paul McCartney that he got in the middle of the night in a dream. And he woke up and uh, when people, musicians get songs in dreams, uh, they aren't like weird dreams where things don't make sense and this sort of thing. They're very clear. Uh, the song is very clear. Uh, they just basically have to wake up and write it down. Every, the, every note is very clear and it's a different type of dream. So when I saw that, I started to look at downloads and the musicians that were involved with UFOs. Now, uh, once I saw that, then I realized that a lot of uh, musicians who I think are experiencers um, actually have sung the song after the gold rush. And I started to wonder, is this a coincidence that they would? Patti Smith, for example, was the first woman to sing on Saturday Night Live, was famous for singing the song Gloria. And uh, she actually sort of indicated that she um, was... Um, uh, not from this planet. The other one was Thom, Thom York, who um, is a, uh, wrote a lot of songs about uh, UFOs and talked about hitting a pheasant one time, driving down a road, and he hit a pheasant. And at that point, he said, I got out of the car and started thinking about alien abduction. Uh, Nina was a very famous German singer who sang a song called 99 Balloons, which I will talk about. And all these experiences I will talk about and show their background experiences in the lecture at the end of the month. Uh, Nina was an, uh, another one, and Flaming Lips, uh, I'll show a video of the lead singer for the Flaming Lips, uh, uh, talking about his experience uh, at a drive-in with a bunch of UFOs that were flying around when he was a young kid, how he became fascinated. Uh, Rob Thomas uh, uh, was very famous, um, had one very dramatic statement that he made that indicated he was an experiencer. And then the weird, the real, really weird one is Dave, Dave Matthews. And here's another coincidence. So Dave Matthews' band sang it. And then just about a month ago, my assistant, uh, Nikki Sakic, who will be joining me later on in this broadcast, um, actually had a um, UFO sighting. Uh, she was tracking in Illinois, where she lives, a bunch of sightings, and then got an indication uh, that the thing was right right near her house and she went to where she had seen the UFO many years ago and sat there and filmed the UFO and I'll just play you part of the filming that she did here. <laughs> And I found that very, very strange that um, you would have a situation where um, she has this UFO sighting and she happens to be playing Dave Matthews at a very loud uh, um, volume. Um, so once again, these, these are stories that sort of got me into this thing. The presentation I'm going to do is um, uh, two hours long. And it will go through all the different um, uh, people that I believe are experiencers and the messages that they got and the download experiences. And it'll be done for portal, uh, portal to ascension, uh, dot org, And uh, people can go there to register for that. But what I'm going to do today is do um, some stuff that won't be in the um, presentation at the end of the month. I'm going to show some other um, uh, stuff that would will appear in book two if it does come. So tuned in book two. Uh, a lot of a lot of musicians uh, use the um, alien uh, theme to make themselves very famous. Here's Ziggy Stardust, and um, uh, a lot of musicians, unlike other people who didn't want to be associated with the UFO phenomena, a lot of musicians actually put UFOs on their cover. There was dozens and dozens of albums in the '70s and '80s that had UFOs on the on the cover. So musicians were not afraid to. Uh, line themselves up with uh, UFOs, talk about UFOs, whereas the va vast majority of the public uh, really didn't want anything to do with it. Um, I, I also show in in the the book, and I, I believe that music crosses all spectrums. That all paranormal phenomena are basically the same thing. Uh, it's all consciousness. It's all linked together. 
So I'm a big fan of Dr. Michael Newton, who invented the techno uh, the um, technique to bring people into the life between lives. So you let let take someone to just their past life, let them die, take them through the dying process, and take them into the spirit world. And uh, he had a seven thousand people, and I believe there's now thirty five thousand people who have gone through this regression uh, procedure, and they all basically describe the same thing. And at one point, he talks to them about music in the in the life between life. As the person's dying, he said, "I'm hearing I'm hearing sounds." And Newton says, "What kind of sounds?" And the the person says, "An echo of music, a musical tingling, uh, wind chimes vibrating with my movements. It's so relaxing." And then Newton says, "Others have defined these as vibrational in nature, similar to the riding on the waves created by the twang of a tuning fork." Do you agree or disagree with this description? And the person, of course, agrees that there, there is this music that does take place um, after uh, people die. Uh, this is uh, Eben Alexander, who uh, has a very famous near-death experience, was a uh, neurologist at Harvard University, and he had a near-death experience and talked about um, being in a sort of a lower vibrational um, world, in sort of like in the muck, and uh, there were, he heard this music, and when he heard the music, it would pull him out and take him to this he heavenly realm. And then he would descend back into the muck, and he would use this, uh, remember this music, which would take him back out into this he heavenly realm. So to him, music was very important in this sort of alternate world uh, that he experienced during his near-death experience. This is one of the uh, more bizarre music stories of all times. This is uh, Rosemary Brown, who was a medium in England, and uh, she was famous for being able to um, uh, channel uh, dead musicians. She had over a dozen musicians, Liszt, uh, Handel, Beethoven, uh, a number of them. Uh, she actually did a demonstration on BBC TV where they, um, they challenged her, and she was taking uh, dictation from uh, Beethoven sitting there and writing down for an hour. She wrote down um, all the notes and uh, at one point she said Beethoven says to hurry up and uh, she's writing this and then at the end of the hour uh, the BBC uh, uh, piano player actually plays this beautiful song that she had produced in this one hour. Uh, she had very limited musical training uh, but she could uh, reproduce. Uh, Liszt was the main guy that she was dealing with uh, but uh, it appeared that these musicians were using her to produce, I think she produced 500 different uh, symphonies and uh, uh, things like that from these different uh, musicians. She also produced paintings. She was able to uh, trans-channel paintings. Uh, here's one of her paintings and it was uh, identified as a Vincent, Vincent van Gogh painting. Um, she also did one here, Samuel Palmer. So she would do musicians and she could also uh, sort of uh, do what's called spirit painting, where the spirit would paint through her. Um, she also talked to a number of uh, um, dead people. And this is very common with, with mediums and it's, it's often the same guys. Carl Jung, she claimed that she was channeling uh, Albert Einstein and um, uh, Bertrand Russell that she was, she was interacting with. She asked, uh, Rosemary Brown asked Litz, why did you pick me? Why, why do you, have you got me for your unfinished symphony? And uh, Litz supposedly responded, uh, a musical background would have caused you to acquire too many ideas and the theories of your own. These would have been an impediment to us. So because she didn't have the musical background, they were able to uh, work through her, which sort of ties into people who have had the um, experience uh, of being an experiencer that they're taken when they're very young children. And, and it was the same idea that if you take someone when they're 25 years old, uh, it's totally useless to work with them because their mind is so um, clogged with false ideas and uh, the ego is so strong that you're not gonna treat, you're not gonna change them. So you have to take people who are not vested in a worldview opposed to uh, what you're being taught. This is um, a spirit painting that was done for me. Uh, and uh, the painter was Leonardo, a very famous uh, painter from uh, uh, many years back. 
Uh, it was um, is done by uh, Sandy Ingham, and uh, she paints uh, people who are are dead people who are in your family. So when I got this, I was kind of surprised. I have not yet figured out who this is. Um, nobody in my family can figure out who this is. It doesn't uh, remind them of anybody. Uh, but it does look uh, very much like Princess Di to me. That's the closest I've ever seen to anybody. That the hair is the same, um, the face is sort of the same, and she's wearing the same outfit that uh, Princess Di is wearing in a number of um, um, different pictures. But uh, spirit painting is very common. There's a lot of people who go into trance and do this spirit painting, and I believe this was like a five-minute effort uh, that was done in this um, in this drawing. Uh, channeled by Sandy Ingham. Another one of the, the composers that came through to Rosemary Brown was uh, Frederick Chopin. And what you see when you start looking across all the different modalities is that Chopin shows up all over the place. Uh, Leslie Flint was the top um, voice medium in the world where he could go into trance and this voice would appear in the room. He did a whole series of people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. It was a huge collection. And Frederick Chopin uh, did hours and hours of conversations over from the 1920s, 1950s to the 1970s. I would know Chopin's voice anywhere based on these, um, these tapes. So uh, these people are coming through all the time. And the other one that came through that shows you these crossovers is uh, Leslie Flint was talking to a guy named her brother Boniface. Now I'm not sure if it's the same one, uh, but there's a, a controversy that extends around the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, which is the, um, the sort of the famous um, number one book for Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you look at uh, Bill Wilson, who was one of the co-authors of it, uh, he stated that he was in contact with Boniface and he was in contact in what he called the spook room, which is his, his restored house that was restored. And he had a seance room and he had an Ouija board and he was dealing with Boniface. And he told the priest, they discovered these letters after he died, uh, that he told the priest that um, he was getting help writing the 12 steps and the 12 traditions from Boniface. And most people don't realize that both the guys who started AA were into uh, seances and that kind of stuff. And that Bill Wilson was actually a trance channeler, like Edgar Casey. He could actually basically, not just channel, but trance channel where he was not even there. Um, so a very interesting story where you have uh, people downloading stuff out of the field from different, um, different walks of life. And when you cross them all over, you realize that everybody has this potential. If you're able to shut the noise down in the left brain, you can pick up the signal and a lot of people are picking up uh, signals from all different types of things. Now, um, a, a lot of people uh, also, um, you, you have uh, Nikola Tesla who appeared in a lot of different uh, experiments. Sherry Wilde, who's a UFO experiencer, uh, stated that she had met him on board a ship, a flying saucer, along with, uh, um, uh, um, Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein and Albert Schweitzer were the others there. The skull experiment had, uh, Tesla was involved. That was dealing with um, physical mediumship and uh, ports and stuff like that. Uh, the soul phone, which is being worked on right now, this new sort of invention, uh, they claim that Nikola Tesla is helping them from the other side. And Son Son Sonia Rinaldi, who's probably the top person on voice, uh, uh, he used to use spirit box. Hers is a lot more detailed in terms of getting voices. And she uh, states that Nikola Tesla is helping her. So again, you have these people who are able to cross the, uh, the, the divide and talk to people on the other side. Um, again, I mentioned Sherry Wilde had had this, this experience where she was on board the ship. And uh, so I asked her when she was talking to these three um, people, there's actually a number of dead people. And I said, to her, I said, well, were these actual physical people like Albert Einstein and these people? And she said, I know where you're going with this. Let me just tell you what, it may have been a very good hologram, but it sure looked real to me. And she was very young when this, when this was going on. So you have people that are able, and a lot of experiencers are able, uh, I'm not sure what the figure is, but it's pretty high 
but the number of experiencers who claim they've seen a ghost or a dead person is like 70 percent it's very very high that these people are uh, are able to transfer over almost like musicians very right brained and able to do it now uh, the book too was going to be helped this is pia knutson who has provided a lot of these sh these slides i'm going to show today uh, she may be helping me on book two if we ever get around to it I have so many projects going. She's in Denmark, used to run UFO Denmark and is now somebody else is running it, but she's been very active for many years and is very good at finding these sort of connections between uh, downloads, music, um, uh, UFO experiencers and stuff like that. And there's a lot of the stuff and she's very interested in it. Whereas I haven't spent too much time on this music thing for a couple of years. And here again, we have this thing uh, this whole idea that you can tap in, if you can figure out how to how to break through the veil, how to turn the noise down, you can pick up the signal. Uh, David Thompson is another one where you see this crossover uh, with music. Uh, David Thompson is a physical medium, uh, one of the best in the world, and he has in his um, thing, Louis Armstrong comes in uh, during his uh, physical uh, seances and plays music and talks and sings and the other one that I was re reportedly came in was John Lennon came in one and Walter Rooker I believe was the one that told me the story and he said it was very real uh, John Lennon was actually I think standing on uh, partly on his wife's foot and it was very very real uh, so you have this this idea that people are that can cross over and you can move over to the other side and that uh, there's this interaction between the other side, the field, the afterlife, whatever it is, and this world. Whereas here we believe it's all cut off. And what you see from these musicians and this kind of stuff is it's not cut off at all. That these people, a lot of people can cross over and gather this material. Uh, this is one of the more dramatic, this is another dramatic story. This also comes out of England. You have Rosemary Brown and you also have Stuart Sharp. This is a dramatic story, Stuart Sharp like uh, Brown had no musical background whatsoever. Uh, he has, he's running a, a pub in England uh, with his wife and his firstborn son is born uh, and he dies at childbirth. And his wife is in the hospital and um, he's, he's not able to bury the child. Uh, nobody will bury the, the, the boy. He's got him in a shoebox type thing and he's uh, totally distraught and he goes to sleep. And during uh, the first night um, after his son's death, after the, the burial, he, they come to him and they say, um, sometimes when this happens, we give per the, the person a gift and he's given an entire symphony in his head. He has no musical background. He can't even play an instrument. And he has this symphony in his head and he tells his wife, he said, uh, for Ben, I have to produce this symphony. And everybody doesn't take him very seriously. And he said, in six months, I'm leaving. I'm going to England. I'm going to London. And I'm going to compose a symphony. And the London Philharmonic Orchestra is going to uh, do it. And they're all going, you can't play music. You're a total idiot. And he, after six months, he basically leaves. He leaves his family. He goes to uh, London. He ends up getting divorced from his wife. Uh, he leaves everything behind. And he goes there and he says, I sit there and wait for the next instruction. And there is no instruction. And he basically spends 20 years and he finds uh, a guy who plays some jazz who starts to help him put this together he learns how to play a guitar and then he's told that in order to get this thing uh, done by the Lynn Philharmonic Orchestra to be played one time he has to raise a million pounds and he said okay fine I'll do that and he goes out and he raises a million pounds and he actually after 20 years produces this symphony and you can look it up on the internet it's called the Angeli Symphony it's played by the London Philharmonic Orchestra and it was the only time that the London Philharmonic Orchestra ever stood up and applauded the composer. So you have this story where every single note in the thing, he could remember it for 20 years and he was able to compose it exactly as he had heard it. Again, this, this idea that you can go in the field, you can pick it up. And a lot of times it comes from uh, the left brain being shut down during sleep or in very great times of trauma. Trauma has an awful lot to do with uh, a person being totally dissociated and when you become totally dissociated uh, it basically shuts down the the conscious 3d mind and you're able to go in the other field you see a lot of uh, these examples of people with trauma who are able to pick up music and other things mathematics all sorts of stuff here he is he wrote a book called the gift and it's actually being made into a, a hollywood movie now 
uh, here, here's an interesting story that talks about um, a lot of composers. Now I did uh, the um, musicians and a lot of people said the, the rock musicians said, ah, oh, they're doing a lot of drugs. They're dealing with the devil and whatever. And so because my whole family was musical and my mother was a church organist, I decided I would go back and I would look at all the famous guys like Bach and Beethoven and Handel and all the people who had com composed uh, music for churches. And here's the story that's told, this film story that's told of a violinist um, in uh, Beethoven's um, orchestra who comes to him and he, he's complaining. The, the concertmaster complains to Beethoven that a certain passage was so badly written for the left hand that it was almost unplayable. Whereupon Beethoven shrieked at him saying, when I composed that passage, I was conscious of him being inspired by God Almighty. Do you think I had time to consider your puny little fiddle piece when he speaks to me? And that's what you see is that in now people are talking about being in contact with aliens and, and dead people and stuff. But in uh, go back 200 years and you'll see the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. They're talking to God. They're getting it from somewhere. And uh, it's just more religious. But this was happening 200 years ago as well. A lot of uh, major composers uh, would be talking about the fact that they weren't writing, it was being written for them. They were just sort of the scribe that was putting the notes down. Uh, here's uh, Paul Simon uh, talking about his hit musics, uh, a lot of his stuff, and he makes this, this statement, you don't have to create it. It's already in existence. You just have to reveal it. And that is what a lot of musicians will say. Uh, Michael Jackson, for example, said he was he was embarrassed to put his name on the song. It was somebody else's song. It was just given to him. He wrote it down, but it wasn't his song. And they believe the music is already composed in the in the in the field, and they just hear it and they record the music, which is, I guess, how it started for me when Chris Bledsoe first told me the story. What I did is I started looking at these download things because I had a download experience, not with music, but with something else. And it was then that I discovered that the, one of the most famous songs of all times, Yesterday by Paul McCartney, came in the middle of the night in a dream. And he woke up and every single note was there. He quickly, there was a piano in the room, he completely posed it. And then he went running around for weeks and talking to people. Did you, have you ever heard this song? He thought someone else had composed it. He thought he was just remembering somebody else's song. So that's the thing. It, it's not like an ordinary dream where it comes in little bits and pieces and it's all crazy. When a person has a dream where they're being given a song, it comes as clear as can be and they know every single note and all they have to do is, is wake up and transpose it. Uh, Keisha is one of the uh, new musicians who talks about her experience and how uh, it, I think her rainbow um, album was influenced by this uh, dramatic UFO sighting she had. Uh, this is a, an older one. This is um, uh, Allison, um, who's a musician in uh, New York City who had a very dramatic experience where um, she was on top of a six-story building on July 4th, I think 1979. This giant UFO comes down like it's going to crash. And at that moment, she gets inspired and she produces, I think, 16 albums. And she basically says uh, she's getting it from the other side. She's, she's composing all this sort of stuff. She's been around doing interviews and stuff. And um, so you see this going to musicians that you may not even know. This is more one of the more famous um, stories I have in terms of my own experience with, with um, music. Um, I can sort of, once I started getting into this and I started realizing that there was these, what I call download songs. At one point I could suddenly realize when it was a download song and I would know this is a download song. And I would go and look it up and sure enough, uh, Viva La Vida is one of those songs. Um, I was in Los Angeles when this happened with my, uh, with my uh, Disclosure Trust lawyer, uh, Michael Hall. We were sitting in a restaurant and Viva La Vida came on. And because I don't really listen to music, I don't really know, I just heard this song and I said to Michael, Michael, what's that song? Well, what's, what are they playing here? What's that song? And he said, I don't know. And so then we, we sat there, we carefully listened. And all you need to do to get one of these songs is you need like five or six words in the lyric all in one thing. And you put it into a Google search and it'll pop it up. So we managed to get the, the five words and it popped up Viva La Vida. And then I, um, I basically um, went out and I um, looked and sure enough, it had been composed three, I think 3.45 in the morning. 
Um, uh, Chris Martin is the the guy who composed it, and it's a it's a it's almost like after the Girl Rush. It has this very uh, sort of spiritual message in it that basically says, uh, "When I ruled the world, I could see the fear in my enemies' eyes. I could drop the bombs, and I had all this power. And then I suddenly realized that." St. Peter probably wasn't going to call my name. And now I'm back to clean up the streets. And it's this reincarnation message that we may rule the world now, but uh, what goes around comes around, what you sow, you reap. And that you may, uh, you may rule the world now, but you may be the person who's getting the bombs dropped or cleaning up the streets in your next life. So it was this very uh, sort of spiritual message that he had to, to this song. And it, it was a download and I'll show you a couple others. I think in the main lecture um, on the 29th, I give a couple of, uh, Chris Martin is one of the big musicians who actually does challenges where he goes on a radio talk show and people phone in and just give him a couple of words and he makes a song up. He's very, very good at, at making up songs uh, on the fly. And uh, he's composed a lot of songs that, that get five, 600 million hits uh, that were composed in like minutes. Uh, this is another one where um, I was with my assistant, Desta Barnaby, on one trip, and um, she has an app on her phone. So um, there was a couple of incidents where I was with her. I said, what's that song? What's that song? And I knew it was a download song, and she would put the app up, and, and the, the of course, it would immediately tell her what song was being played on in the restaurant, wherever we were. And I it would always turn out to be right. There was a, a, a number of incidents that I can, I can just sense it. I know that it, it's a, not an ordinary song, that the person got it from the field. And so there's um, a number of them that I will, I will describe. Here's Chris Martin talking about um, uh, a song that he composed. And he, like all the rest, he cannot read or write music. He just sits and he plays and he um, d dills around on the piano or on his, his guitar, just waiting for something weird to come up that sounds, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And then he basically comes and that's how the majority of his songs come. And he does the, the majority of the writing uh, for the band. You know, Grant, if you'll let me yeah. hop in for just a second. You know, you're describing this, how like with uh, Michael Hall and with Desta, and it's making me chuckle here because this was also a synchronicity for me that kind of made me start following you. And I had no idea about the music book that you had written, but how I started following this, it, what rang a bell for me just now is when you said how you hear a song and you're almost, and it speaks to that experience side of you where you're like, I know this is coming from the field or that spot. It's almost like you can pick up on these songs. And that is something that I myself and a lot of other experiencers were talking about for a long time. And we even started playing games like, you know, what songs can you come up or what playlist can you make that you know you know the song is you know speaking the phenomenon is speaking yeah. through it yeah. and the last three artists you just rolled through are, are on a lot of people's playlists but i think one that just took me by surprise was kesha so i haven't heard her story behind her music that'll be interesting for me to track down so yeah, that's all I wanted to say. That was very interesting. Yeah, there's one band that's escaping me. It's in the main lecture. See, I'm I'm, I'm a musical idiot, so I can never remember the names of these bands because I had to memorize all this stuff. Uh, but there's there's one band. Um, um, what's the band called? Um, anyway, where where people said that when they first heard it. The one woman said she just about dropped her knees. I mean, she just took her, and and then I'll talk to other people, and they'll say, "Oh yeah, yeah, I know, I I, I know that that band," and 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 it seems like almost every experiencer listens to this band, and so mm -hmm. you you get this sort of thing where they're speaking through certain musicians, and when you talk to the musician, like with Chris Martin here, where he says they ask him and say, you know, you you get these songs, are they like five hundred million hits or whatever. And, and you, you don't, can't read and write music, like, where do you get the song from? And that's where he says, well, that's the $100 billion question. Nobody knows where it comes from. It's like being a fisherman. You know you, you have all, all the rods 
and all the jackets, but you can't really make the fish come to you. I suppose again, but uh, just to sit and play and play and play and wait and and when a good song comes or what I deem to be a good song, when a good song comes, I don't have any idea where it comes from. All I can say is it's just time and and I just put in the hours. When I feel like I've played too much piano, then I know I'm doing too much. I'll stop and I'll pick up the guitar and detune it all so that I don't know what I'm doing in which uh, in which is to me the best way I think. And he talks a lot about this sort of thing where um, they um, they know when the song is there and it, it, it comes and they know you got to write it down. I'll, I'll mention one here a little bit later with uh, uh, Carol King, who talks about she's the first woman ever to sell 20 million uh, albums as a, as a singer. And You Got a Friend is the song that she got that made her famous. And she said, I'm sitting at the piano and I'm playing. And she said, all of a sudden, the song started to come. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, I hope I remember this. And she sold 20 million albums for that song. She knew from the time she was, it came across, she started to play this song, she knew it would be famous. And all the musicians will say the same thing. I knew that song would be, would be the uh, famous song. Here's this uh, Stockhausen guy, uh, the pioneer in electric, uh, electronic music, believed that he came from uh, a, st uh, a planet orbiting the star Sirius and that he was put on earth to give voice to a cosmic music that will change the world. I do not, I do not make my music, but I only replay the vibrations I receive, he said in his 1968 autobiography. Very famous with electronic music, and, a lot, and I have a section in the book, and in the lecture I'll talk about this, how many musicians believe they didn't come from here? Patti Smith, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, said, I was dropped here. I, I, I didn't come from here. I was dropped here. I don't look like anybody in my plan, in my family. Uh, I feel alone on earth. Uh, John Denver would be the most famous, sold 54 million albums. John Denver believed he came from the constellation Lyra. And he actually writes a song called Spirit, which was mm -hmm. released after he died which talks about this constellation and the stars in the constellation. It was released, but John Denver believed he was actually from somewhere else. And there's a lot of musicians, Sun Ra, there's a whole list of musicians who actually believe uh, they weren't from around here. This, who you just mentioned, uh, Carl Stockenhausen, is yeah. that how you say Stockhausen? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned he was a pioneer in, in that kind of synthesized music. And a, a spinoff from him that I do know about is another group. Uh, they go by the name of Half Japanese, and they were pioneers in the early 80s of this style of music as well. It's more like their theory was you could create music out of noise. And those two, David Fair and his brother, they actually had a UFO witness encounter themselves and wrote a lot of music about it, an entire album, I believe. And they happened to influence um, a very popular band that everybody might know as Nirvana. Oh, so yeah. see, there's, there's a spin out effect to this yeah. experience or music, so. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing that that I think I have in the book. Um, I'll probably mention in the main presentation that I do on the 29th. But a lot of the people who get it, like John Denver was, was this country music. He invented country, this country music type thing. They were all pioneers. Sun Ra was one of the first jazz guys ever to play. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, and there's a whole list of them. That, um, like um, the only album I ever bought or the only song I ever bought was Wipeout. Uh, it was written by Merrill Fankhauser, who started um, surf rock. Uh, he mm -hmm. was a pioneer of surf rock, and he's an experiencer. He's got downloads from, uh, had the UFO sighting, and wrote a song that he actually played for John Lennon based upon a UFO sighting that he'd had in Hawaii. So you have these guys that are pioneers. They're not just people who are playing music, but they're the guys who started a certain type of music, which could be indicative of the fact that the phenomena or the intelligence or whatever is introducing these two new types of music to create a certain mm -hmm. vibration and that's why these people are chosen, that they have chosen this role, because a lot of them are pri uh, pioneers in the type of music that they do. 
Well, you, you speak often about how the phenomenon changes over the decades and yeah. how it seems to uh, upgrade itself. You know, here we have an example of it with music. I, I wonder if that traverses into other artistic areas as well as like, yeah, I would in think. evolution and painting and, or even theater and comedy. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like the idea where um, my father listened to jazz and I used to think jazz and I still sort of hate jazz, but, and, and us was, it was like rock music. And then I hear the stuff my kid was playing and I'm going, how can you listen to that stuff? And it's like every, every person thinks that their parents' music was total junk and that theirs is sent by God. So you, you see the music keeps changing and uh, it may be that it's a, it's an evolution of, of, of consciousness that that's, that's moving this along. That it, that it does change and everything uh, seems to change. Well, you know, my, my latest artist, musical artist that I've heard is an experiencer, his name is Post Malone. And he'll, his albums are just going crazy right now, like all of them. And he just yeah. admitted to having an experience on uh, the Joe Rogan experience. There so well, it well, would be well. interesting to see if his sighting experiences have been reflected in his music because you know he's a hip-hop artist so that would be another musical avenue <laughs> yeah, we'll have to put that in book two because there, there are piles of them and i i just i have so well, many projects going at the same time that i don't really have time to do book two but there's there's a lot of these things and it's just a matter of, of sticking them down whether it's a download song or whether it's a contact to ufos or whatever that um and a lot of people i was even talking had an interview with shannon taggart who photographs uh seance type stuff and she mm -hmm. wants to talk about this so she's got something as well that she says yeah i think you're right with the connection with this uh music and the the download stuff so she must have looked at that herself and there's a lot of this stuff it's just a matter of do you have time to gather all the songs right this one here like all these ones i'm doing today are, are not in the book and they're not in the the lecture I'm going to do. These are just new so, new stuff that I got since I released the book and stuff that's come lately. This Jesse guy here, uh, he talks about this this he meets this guy and he knows I've got to talk to this guy. And the, the guy talks to him about his son has died and he's standing right right along the water. And he said, "This is where I put his ashes." And he touched the water. And uh, this Jesse immediately said. I got to remember that, um, that you was so touched by the story. And he wrote a song called Touch the, Touch the Water, uh, which took 30 minutes to, um, to produce. And he said, once they uh, decided they were going to do it, it just came to them. And you see this over and over again that, uh, in fact, I've got an appendix of songs that were produced in under 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And it's like uh, maybe 150 different songs. Uh, going back to the, the most of the stuff's going to be rock music that I'm going to do. Uh, the Beatles, the Stones, all their connections to UFOs and stuff. Most people don't know this. I'll actually play the one minute uh, commercial from uh, Goodnight Vienna, which was done by uh, Ringo Starr, the, the drummer for the Beatles. And he does this commercial that John is in this commercial and uh, he gets in this flying saucer and he flies around Los Angeles and he lands on top of the RCA building in Los Angeles and he's waving on top of this flying saucer. So um, people don't realize the Beatles had a real great interest in UFOs and were actually uh, doing these bizarre uh, flying saucer commercials in 1974. Uh, this is another one. This is in your area. Nicole, if I ever come down there, you have to arrange uh, that we go and visit this guy. This is my... Uh, a bucket list to talk to this guy. This is uh, Daryl Lemke, who is in Illinois or just on the other side in Wisconsin. Uh, this is the guy, I don't know if you're familiar, and when I talk about this thing with trauma, that uh, trauma will flip people into that zone. So uh, here's a uh, he's autistic, he can't speak. Um, he um, uh, was lying in bed, he'd never moved. His mother is, is he, he was, it wasn't even his mother, it was his uh, woman that took care of him. And uh, she played this little piano beside him, and uh, he he could he never moved. He just lay in the bed. He couldn't speak or whatever. And she said, woke up one night, and suddenly she said to her husband, "Did you leave the piano? Did you leave? Did you leave the TV on?" She said, "No, I didn't leave it on." And they went in, and he had somehow got himself out of the bed, and he was sitting at this piano, and he was playing. 
and he can play any song, plus he can actually imitate. So if he's doing a Louis Armstrong song, he can actually imitate Louis Armstrong. And this is this idea where he can't, he, he, and he could sing these songs and play any song he'd ever heard, like 8,000 songs or whatever it was. They could challenge him this song. He would know all these songs. He only had to hear it one time and he could actually sing with the, with the, the person. And um, he um, has been doing this and he's now still there, uh, but he could, he could sing seven years before he could speak. So he could sing songs, but he couldn't speak and he couldn't walk and they had to teach him how to walk. And now his, his uh, caregivers are dead, but he's still there. And it's one of the things I'd love to go and, uh, and, and see him play. I'm not sure where he is, but I think he's staying with, his, uh, with this woman's daughter, but she'd be getting wow. old now. So that's one thing we got to do. And you get all these people. Uh, this is the other guy, uh, 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 Daryl Pavicini who um, was on 60 Minutes. Uh, this is the guy who can, again, can play any song. And this is trauma, he's, he's autistic, um, basically can't speak. Uh, they asked him on 60 Minutes, can you show me three fingers? And he put up five fingers. He doesn't know how old he is. He can do nothing except play the piano. And they can give him any song and say, play this song and then say, okay, play it in ragtime play it in jazz and he can actually change or change the key instantaneously as they tell him, do this, do this, change it to this, change it. And it's unbelievable. And, and this is this trauma thing where the left brain, this is you got left brain damage, left brain is completely shut down and the right brain has in this field and just pulling this stuff out mm -hmm. with tremendous talent that the average person doesn't have because we have a left brain that's creating this signal and noise, noise that blocks the signal. Amazing. This is uh, Joe Wood, and in the um, I'm not going to do it tonight. Tonight, but um, Joe Wood um, is um, a, a woman who was married to Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones for 30 years. Here's her with Dan Aykroyd. In the lecture, I'm going to do this bizarre synchronicity. I've had some really bizarre synchronicities around music. One dealt with Joe Wood. It's a bizarre story. I don't have time to tell it tonight, but um, she had a UFO experience with her husband uh, Ronnie Wood. Uh, they were in Brazil, and um, Ronnie saw it over the ocean and uh, called her out. She went out to see this thing, and um, he said, I got to get my glasses. He went running back in, and that's you see this often in UFO experiences where they, they get the one person out of the way, and then they perform, and she was just blown away by this thing taking off and flying and doing all these, these things, and then she's with her son, and um, they're on the Stones plane, and they're flying along and um, this thing comes down the side of the plane and her 16 year old son is there and he said mom what is that it's coming down the side of the plane like an orb flying down the side of the plane and she said i have no idea and then it goes back down and it flies away and they're the only ones that see it but it's, it lasts for, for for a while this orb flying along inside of the plane and uh, both of them are uh, he runs a company that takes plastic out of oceans and she's an environmentalist as well and an animal rights uh, person and that's what you'll see over and over again is that these people are not only um, triggered with experiences they suddenly become uh, activists. Uh, Libby Newton-John is a prime example who had a UFO sighting when she's 15 years old that she was so close it made her hair stand up and uh, she's one of the biggest animal rights activists and you'll see that over and over again uh, experiencers who are vegetarians, uh, who are activists for the for the ecology and stuff like that. So uh, Joe Wood is doing a show, and she brings on a lot of experiencers because there's a lot of experiencers, and I was helping feed a lot of the stories to them. Interview this person, musician. They've had experiences in this musician, and so she started bringing them in. This is Robbie Williams, who's very famous in Great Britain, and she did the interview with him, and he talked about his UFO experiences, and um, she did. Uh, uh, Sean Ryder, who's the other big, this is part of the, um, the synchronicity I had. It dealt with an interview she did with Sean Ryder, who is a very famous musician. And uh, she does a lot of these uh, things. And I did, that's the last time I did my pres sort of presentation on music. Uh, I talked to Joe Wood about uh, the connection between music and uh, we were going to do a second show, but we still haven't done it yet. But she's fascinated, does a show called um, uh, Alien Nation in Great Britain and is down the rabbit hole with the rest of us and uh, knows the connection between music and UFOs. Uh, this is another um, uh, musician. 
And he talks about this horrifying experience. That's the way they wrote it up. He saw two UFOs, big deal. And so you get a lot of them will go public. Uh, this is uh, another famous musician that came out of Winnipeg. This is, uh, uh, um, <laughs> I'm going to forget his name. Not Randy Backman. Um, um, the um, head of the, anyway, he's the head of the uh, Guess Who, um, yeah. Burton Cummings. And Burton Cummings wrote the very famous song that I always bug you about, American Woman. And this is a song that he they, they were going to play in the White House, and uh, the, the White House blocked them from playing it. Uh, Julie uh, Nixon's wife wanted this played, and they blocked it because uh, they thought it was derogatory to American women. To American women. Uh, the song that, that comes with that, and I talk about it in the thing, it came spontaneous in a concert they were giving in uh, Toronto. Uh, Backman had broken a string, and um, uh, Burton Cummings was in behind the set, and he came running on stage and he was playing this riff from American Woman. And he said, sing something, sing something. And he said, American Woman, stay away from me. And he starts singing the song. And they did not even remember playing the song. When it was over, there was a kid, this is, I think, 1968. Uh, first handheld tape recorders were there. The kid had a handheld tape recorder. He was holding it up and they knew he was going to bootleg the show. So they got the manager to grab the kid and grab his tape from him. And at the end of the show, they listened to the, 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 the concert on this tape recorder and uh, beginning of the second set, here comes this song, American Woman. And they went, where'd that come from? Nobody remembered even playing it. And, and if it hadn't been for the kid with the tape recorder, the song American Woman, which was number one for three weeks in the United States would not have existed. So you get these type, type of songs where they come instantaneously, not in five minutes, they come instantaneously where the people just play them and they are the most famous songs of all times. Here's the wedding song. This is a very, very famous song. Uh, this came in, in a download experience. Um, this is a song where um, uh, Paul said um, his name does not appear as the author, either on the record or the sheet music. Neither does he receive any of the royalties. This is because he says that after he prayed, he was given the song. All that was required was to allow the pencil to move across the page. The song is a celebration of love of a newlywed couple and their union with God. On his website, Stukely says, in every songwriter's life comes a song, the source of which cannot be explained by personal experience. So he wrote the song, my sister had a band, not a band, but a group, her and my other sister, and they, uh, she just put on my Facebook site today, uh, we sang this song at many uh, weddings. It's a very famous song. You'll know it if you hear it. And uh, he does not take any royalties because he does not take any responsibility for the song. It was given to him. Uh, here's uh, Shania Twain talking about uh, writing a, um, a song. It came, and this is what happens in the download. One of the contact modalities is that you get bored. So when I had my download experience in 2012 watching Colin Andrews, I was sort of bored with the lecture. I didn't, wasn't really interested. That's when it came. So Shania Twain wrote a famous song uh, from this moment on at a soccer game where she was sort of tuning out and the song started to come in her head. And every musician will say, there it is. They know, get the pen out, start writing. It, the song is coming. And they just record it. Uh, the song was written at a soccer game in Italy as a, a love song between uh, Twain and Lang. Twain explained, we were at Italy two years ago. We were at the soccer game. My husband loves sports. I don't know the game that well. So my mind drifted and I started writing. So whether it's a trauma event, like a, uh, uh, say, left brain damage where you're, uh, you're autistic or savant, uh, or whether you're just tuning out, or whether you're sleeping, where a, long, a lot of songs come when you're sleeping, when you, the left brain goes to sleep and tunes out, that's when the, the channel opens, the signal is picked up, and people pick up these, these type of songs. Here's another one, A Bad Day. This is a famous, I, this is another one I knew was it was a, I knew this was a download song. This was year five of American Idol. And this is a song that they sang to everybody at, when you got kicked off. They would sing this, uh, Having a Bad Day. And uh, it was written by a Canadian musician. And he said, uh, uh, I had this melody which stuck in my head. It wouldn't go away. I just, I, I would sing it over and over again. And that's where the song came from. It was, a, it was a download thing he couldn't get out of his head. And it became this very famous song that was played at, at the end of every American Idol show. Uh, Tom Petty talking about great songs. There's some kind of actual magic going on there. 
oh, I haven't, I haven't got, oh, I, I, I've got the words, but anyway, he, he talks about the fact that, uh, that basically he has no idea where it's coming from, uh, that it, it comes to him and uh, it, it's magic and I don't push it too much, but when it comes, uh, I, I quickly record it. Um, here's um, uh, James Taylor. Now, James Taylor was the one that became famous because of um, the, the song, uh, You Got a Friend uh, by uh, Carol King. When Carol King was playing the piano, uh, she gave the song to him to sing and he said, as soon as I had it, I knew exactly how to play it. It was as if I had invented the song as well. He became famous. She became famous, sold 20 million albums. And this is what he says. I've always felt as if it was an unconscious process. Rather than writing the songs, I am just the first to hear them. I need three days of quiet. I need three days of boring before I start to hear them. So again, you're shutting down the left brain. You're you're disassociating, you're quieting the brain down. He's doing like a meditation process. And as soon as he's got three days of being bored where the left brain shuts off, he starts to hear the songs. Um, here's um, uh, uh, one I'm gonna do and I'm, uh, this is sort of the end, I think, of, the, of the, this presentation. This is uh, Roland Griffith who runs the, ex um, the psilocybin experiments at John Hopkins University. And um, I've, done some psilocybin experiments lately and I actually got a download. This is uh, last night, it was last night. And in there, they're, they're doing this whole thing where they're giving people eight, eight um, uh, grams of uh, psilocybin and the people um, have this very dramatic experience. And I was basically um, given the, the idea that um, the music is tied into um, vibration, emotion, and because mine was all emotion, and I suddenly realized that this ties into a UFO phenomena, and that is the experience of people seeing the screen on the ship. Now, I, I appeal to people who've seen the screen to contact me, um, and what people will talk about, because we see it from our own physical 3D egotistical world, and we say, oh, these aliens are playing with people, they're forcing them to watch this screen, 39% of all experiencers who have been on board the ship, you say, have you seen the screen? You don't have to explain what the screen is. If they've seen the screen, they'll tell you, yeah, I saw the screen. And the screen is they're forced to watch a screen where they see the environmental devastation of the earth. They see a giant wave. They see fire. Uh, they see uh, nuclear catastrophes, stuff like this. And they are not allowed to turn away. They're, they cannot close their eyes. They cannot turn away. They are forced to watch this. And people say this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the grays are jerking them around. They're, they're working on emotions. They want to see how we uh, have emotions. And what I discovered in the psilocybin experiments is that you have raw emotion, that when a psilocybin experience, you, all your filters are taken off your, your, um, uh, your nerves and you see these visions and it's exactly the same thing you see the vision and you get raw emotion, very dramatic. And I'm sure it's the same thing. It's the idea that when you see these images and they can somehow make you see it with raw emotion, that it triggers the person. And that's why you get so many experiencers who turn out they're environmentalists, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, vegetarians, they're animal rights people, is that they have seen this screen thing with this raw emotion. And one of them was, uh, the, the guy wrote the book, The Children of the Greys, where he talked about seeing the screen. And he said to the, to the, the gray, you're, you're not going to do this. You're, you're not going to do this. You're not going to let this happen to the earth. And as soon as then the gray just said, yeah. And then they, he suddenly was given what he was told was the cure to cancer, a 3D holographic vision of this formula. And I had a second woman who had the same experience. And I actually offered to put the money up to get them both to be regressed to pull the formula because Yvonne Smith told me that you could pull the formula, that that would be something that they would be able to remember. And I wanted to see if the formula was the same because they both had the same experience of being told about the cure to cancer and had seen this 3D holographic image. So you have this idea where people are being shown the screen. And the other one is uh, Susie Hansen talks about this thing. And this, I won't get too much into detail, but this has to do with what's called rapid image cycling which uh, the, uh, the intelligence, the UFO aliens or whatever you want to call them, are using. 
and she says we are we are sat in a room in a big theater there's 200 250 people in the room the bean comes on and they start seeing these images flashing environmental images one then another then another then another then another 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 and she said at one point they are going at like a hundred a second and they had taught us how to to follow these images of these environmental things. And she said, people were crying and it was this raw emotion and people were there and then the being just came and he waved his hand and he, he, he waved his hand and all the fear went away. All, the, all the, the people stopped crying, but the images stayed with them. And that's what I think is going on. That's the same as the psilocybin thing, that you have this experience with very raw emotion and it's very, it's very learning, it's very telling where you can, and PTSD, depression, uh, all sorts of things that he's able to do. And it seems to be a process that crosses over into the UFO field. So that's basically my presentation. Uh, the 29th for two hours, I will go through mostly rock and roll music and the connections and the Beatles and the Stones and how many of them saw UFOs and Elvis Presley. And I'll go through all those people and where songs come from and download songs. And I want to thank everybody for listening. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening, as Mike Clellan would say. And uh, I'll just uh, stop the screen here. And if we have anything that uh, Nicole wants to talk about, we'll sort of wrap this up. I just have one question I'll ask Grant. Yeah. Um, in, in your your research with book one and music, would you say that from all these artists and all these hit songs, would you say that you have found a common theme with this music? Is it love or coming together or? Um, love, love, love and oneness would be the two messages that the experiences get. 54% of all experiences say they were talked to about oneness and love. Uh, you get these, these uh, sort of themes and yet you still get, um, there was the, um, Clown Posse, what was their name? They were a, a, a band, and people have this idea that, oh, they only come and they have, uh, you know, inspirational messages, whatever. Well, the Clown right. Posse were, they had this <laughs> they old love, love, Clown Posse, yes. They, they were big with me and when I was in college. <laughs> yeah, and they, they sold 11 million albums. They have a <laughs> song called Imagine. You know, yeah. And they're doing, you know, F this, F that. They're singing this stuff. And, and the idea oh, is that if the beings yeah. want to make contact, they're going to contact the 11 million people because they were like the, the, they were, uh, the gangs. That's the only people that really listen to them are these gangs. And <laughs> so they, they had these songs. But if you look at their song called Imagine, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a UFO. they got the UFOs flying around. And it's this thing yeah. about how magnificent the universe is. Completely different songs. Hey, so, I'm I'm going to have a lot of friends <laughs> from uh, Southeast Missouri State down in Cape Girardeau that are going to go nuts over when I tell them it's St. Clown Posse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They and, are. They're going to love it. <laughs> and, and so that's what I would do is I would look at, uh, I would look at songs and that, that's why you almost need like somebody else. I haven't got enough of, you know, people assisting mm -hmm. me to do this. But what you do is, is you look at somebody who does a UFO song and then you, you go, you look at them and you put in alien abduction, you start looking and you find out they're, they're experiencers and they've never made it public. Yeah. Like, uh, like Burton Cummings, for example, um, I, what I noticed was that the person who seems to be the experiencer in the band is always the lead singer. It's never the drummer. It's never, it's always the lead singer. So of course, mm -hmm. when I saw, and I, at one point I thought they had every single musician. I thought they had abducted everybody. That was that there's that many of them. And so then I said, well, what about the Guess Who? Because the Guess Who in Canada was outselling the Beatles in the 1960s. It was, that was, a, it was a very famous band. So I said, well, what about Burton Cummings? I wonder if Burton Cummings got abducted. And so I put in Burton Cummings abduction and up pops his Facebook page. And it says, I'm 64 years old. I'll say whatever the hell I want. Uh, they're mistreating Whitley Strieber. They're treating him like he's crazy. And I'm going, nobody knows who Whitley Strieber is. Come on. And he says, I know exactly how he feels. <laughs> so he has not gone public. But when I saw that, I said, they got Burton Cummings too. I mean, it's like, just bizarre. Well, another nice little maybe end note is through this COVID crisis and all of us sheltering in, you and I did start talking about this music that started going global and, you know, people really 
doing performances just to make other people feel better about this yeah. cruddy situation we're all in. Well, here, Burton Cummings, uh, Chris Martin from Coldplay, and Dave Matthews have been three of the biggest people that are doing live performances to kind of spread this love through the oneness virus, as you like to call it. So that's also an interesting note too it's fun and music makes people happy you know and yep. a lot yep. of the phenomenon engaging with it is raising the vibration like you yep. said so i think that's a key part is, is the vibration thing that it's not just because people say is it the lyrics like you're asking like is it the is it a certain message it's it's the mm -hmm. message it's the um uh the vibration it's um because especially with the psilocybin that's when i suddenly it, it was on a kind of aha moment it's like oh i know what's going on now is this this idea that it make you feel a certain way and um music is one of the key things so uh, the way i say because people say well why would you use a musician i say when you have a child like you have you have will who's like four mm -hmm. and i've told you this many times until he's 10 years old you are going to be his hero you're going to be the greatest thing in his life. And at 10 years old, he's going to say, mom, could you walk a little bit ahead of me, please? And right. then at, at 15 or 16, he's going to say, mom, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going, I, I wouldn't want you to come. We're going to go do this. Can you stay home? And uh, you become the idiot. They, they don't want anything to do with you because their ego starts to develop. They start becoming themselves. Mm -hmm. And the parents are, it's like my parents are stupid. They got terrible music or whatever. And so if you want to influence uh, the generation if you want to get the message across and that's the whole thing with abductions you do not take a child you do not take someone when they're 25 years old because you're wasting your time the person is as knows exactly what they believe they're, you're not going to change their ideas on anything but if you if you grab a kid who's very young who's pliable then you can you can get them and if you want a kid who's like say between 10 and 25 years old Every kid is looking to get their identity. Their ego is coming online mm -hmm. and they want to be something. They want to change the world. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. So they're looking for something. If you want to get a message across, who better to get than who is a, a kid between 10 and 25? Who is their hero? It's not their mother. It's not their father. It's a musician. Yeah. And so they're going to listen to the musician. So if their musician is putting a message to them, that's when they get it. So that's why I think they pick musicians because they're influencing that mm -hmm. age range between 10 and 25. And once you're 25, you're not going to get abducted. They don't care about you anymore. Uh, you, you, everything's settled. They want to influence and put the message to kids who are in that teenage years. Well, I think uh, if it's meant to have an intention of opening people's minds generations at a time i'll i'll say that it's working because not only is the music reaching you know the new generation but as you can see just by who you have brought up tonight these songs and these musicians also stand the test of time too they they're not rarely i would say they're a one-hit wonder but if it they are a one-hit wonder it was a top you know of the charts breaking song that is forever stuck in people's brains. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what you'll also find is that if you look at people, one hit wonders, and that, that would be something, if I were to do the research for the book too, you take one hit wonders and then look mm -hmm. at those people because they got one song, because the songs that, that are the download songs are never the never the bottom of the chart. They're always the top songs. And and I, and the, in the presentation I'll do at the end of the month, I'll go through some of these songs that uh, like, for example, um, uh, songs that pe people will all know, um, like the, some of the Beatles songs. Um, um, uh, Whoa, well, now I'm going to forget the song. Uh, Mother Mary <laughs> Comes to Me Speaking Words of Wisdom, Let It Be, Let It Be, like Let It Be by Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, oh, I know that song, whatever. And everybody thinks, oh, it's Mother Mary from the Bible. And when you actually look at the song, and people get shocked when they realize where the where the lyrics came from. He was in a time of trouble. He was he was traumatized. He'd been divorced. He was on drugs. The Beatles were breaking up, and he he went to sleep. And his mother, whose name was Mary, who died when he was 14 years old of cancer, comes to him. He's 18 years old or whatever, and she comes to him and she said, "It'll be okay, Paul. Let it be." That's where the song comes from. His mother came to him and he said, it was so nice to see my mother again. 
and uh, that's people don't realize where these songs come, and it's 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 really sort of enlightening to realize that these people, even though they were like seen to be drug guys and doing whatever and running around with women or whatever, they would have these songs, but it would always be the top song. It would never be the B side. It would always be the A side. And so if you were to take one hit wonders and stuff like that, I can almost guarantee you that a lot of those songs, there's going to be a story behind it. It came to them in a dream or something because they don't like musicians. Chris Martin might be an exception where he gets a lot of songs, but a lot of musicians will get one song in their life. Sting. He has a song, I can't remember what it's called, in 1983. He has a song that I think was still getting $2,000 a day playing rights, like like three decades wow. later. And he said, that song, five minutes, 10 minutes tops. Woke up and it was in his head. And that's the thing. It's like, And he has not that many famous songs, but you'll get these guys, their most famous song, you take a look at it, and I'll guarantee you, there's probably something about that song that came in some sort of inspirational way. In this game that I play with some of my experiencer friends and just other research that has kind of led us around, you know, like you said, the music and raising the vibration is uh, along with playing this game and some of the research into the right brain, left brain, you know, that you've done as well is I came across a bit of information about and I think it was labeled under like the spiritual gifts of music, you know, and one thing that I noted, um, and it has to do with right brain activity and, you know, that, that heightened sense um, that you find with experiencers is that music, and I won't say like normal people, but music in your average person does not give you the feeling that you want to dance at the same time that it will give you goosebumps. Yeah. But in experiencers, that double effect happens often. And I've noticed it a lot when I hear an experiencer song. You know, it's like, oh, this one's weird. I feel like moving. And yep, there come the goosebumps. And then, yeah, then I'll turn around and talk to you and you'll be like, yep, that was a downloaded song, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. I just, it's remember, I just remember the name of the band was the Moody Blues. The Moody Blues oh, yeah, yeah. Were, abducted, were abducted in 1967, going from mm -hmm. Manchester into London. They were three hours late. They'd tell the whole story. They drew the being. One of them drew the being of, of what they saw, whatever. Uh, if you take a look at their music, uh, they have uh, uh, thinking is the fastest way to travel. They have all these songs. When you start looking at the Moody Blues band, songs and start looking yeah. at the lyrics, you realize they're all experiencers, all, all of the whole band. There's been three bands that were totally abducted. One was the Moody Blues, one was a band out of Scotland, and another one was uh, the famous story in Canada, St. Catharines, 1972. Uh, that's a book that we are, Desta is helping publish. Um, that's uh, Steve Boucher's book, uh, and mm -hmm. they were all abducted. And he tells the story of how they were, they were stopped and uh, when they were going back from a thing and how they abducted the entire audience. Uh, yeah. I think that story I'll tell. I mean, it's it's an incredible story, and he's he's got a book coming out now on that story. But you'll see this kind of thing where, over and over again, musicians are being uh, taken, and I think it's part of a plan to get a message across. And uh, so, you might want to, with your latest endeavors and research into the psilocybin, you might want to check out who I mentioned earlier with half Japanese and David Fair, because that's what he said a lot of his UFO exciting experiences were while he was under the influence yeah. of these types of drugs. So it's not surprising at all, but I think what's notable in his story is he remembers seeing what I would call like a mothership, like a city-sized craft. And he said it's just forever like ingrained in his memory he can see it like it's plain as day <laughs> wow. fascinating fascinating stuff i mean hopefully we can do a second book, he yeah, book stories what's that he actually compiled he actually compiled a book on his um experiences with the phenomenon and he's it's titled ufo uninvited future observers so that that could be an interesting read for you. It's probably one of the weirdest ufology books I've ever read, actually. So 
<laughs> well, that could actually be a chapter in the second book because there, you know, there's so many stories that, that people should mm -hmm. know. I mean, the, the first book, a lot of people have seen. And then there was, in, for, in fact, uh, Alien Rock was done by my, uh, by, um, before me. And mm -hmm. so when he, he heard I was doing a book on music, then he said, well, I've got, his book is 330 pages or whatever. He said, oh, I got more. I'm going to do another book. And um, he had a, a stroke and died. So I was going to New York and I'm saying, anybody know where the manuscript went? Because uh, he would have a lot of stories that never made it. He was doing a second book and he died as he was doing the book. So there's a lot of stories out there. And it's a lot of people are into music. I think a lot of people would be very interested if there's a second book that sort of described these bizarre uh, stories. Even like the, the one with the, the medium who's, who's getting music. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you see the video of her transposing music from Beethoven while she, she's just sitting there. I would say from all corners of the artistic world, you know, art really does reflect society in a lot of ways or reflects what society, what society has issues with, I should say, and really pushes the envelope in a guiding way. And right now music is at the forefront as an art form in being able to reach society like that. I mean, honestly, it's not in painting these, these days or even in photography. It is, music reaches the masses. So what better way to download a message? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And thanks for uh, helping me with this. And uh, Anytime. We'll we'll uh, carry on with uh, some of the other presentations we wanted to do. Yep.